Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Listener Word Stravaganza 2. Hi everybody, we're doing something a little different this week, since it's just me. We had some trouble getting our schedules coordinated, which is funny considering nobody's doing anything. But anyway, such is life. We'll be back to our regular routine shortly, I'm sure. But uh, for now, here we are. So right off the top, I hope everyone is still doing well and holding up wherever you happen to be and however this whole COVID-19 thing is affecting your place of abode and residence. Uh, It seems like things, generally speaking, are getting better. So yeah, light at the end of the tunnel. I guess we're on the moving moving in the right direction. So hopefully you guys are all keeping well. Uh, We're doing something a little different. Like I said, we put out a call over Facebook and Twitter and on our Facebook group Uh, If you're not part of that, by the way, we have a Facebook group as well as our page. So it's Word Nerd HQ and just a place where everyone can kind of kick around links and share posts and just kind of hang out and be word nerdy together. Um, So, yeah, we put out a call on those various platforms, just asking people if they had any words that they had been thinking about recently uh, and maybe they'd like us to look into. So we did that and they did that. And now here we are. So, without further ado, our first one is comes from Herb Nesbitt, who posted on the Word Nerd HQ Facebook group post. His word was interesting. I hadn't heard of it before. Uh, his word is skookum, S-K-O-O-K-U-M. And uh, it's an indigenous word. I, as soon as I looked it up, I was like, oh, I don't like that so much. Uh, the OED and the etymology section... For this word just says Chinook jargon, which, eh, you know, we'll get to in a second. But um, before we do that, the earliest citations are all from sort of the mid 1800s. And they're all from books that have very manly men doing manly things names like Journal Tour Beyond the Rocky Mountains or 10 Years in Oregon or Bear Hunting in White Mountains and the like. Uh, interestingly, there was a 1901 citation from what seems to be a surprisingly self-aware newspaper called The Daily Colonist in Victoria, B.C. Uh, I guess it was otherwise known as The British Colonist, and now is The Times Colonist. So, a bit on the nose, but here we are. So the earliest was as a noun, and it was to describe an evil spirit or a disease. And that was sort of relatively short-lived, but it was there, and it was technically first. But... Only 10 years later, we got a citation in an adjective form, which seems to be the much more common use. I mean, as common as it is now, it's a fairly old term now, but uh, it means strong, stout, brave, fine, splendid, all those generally positive things, which is interesting to think that it was used basically at the same time as an evil spirit or disease or these other things which are generally very positive. But I guess if you're taking a more neutral view of things, evil spirits and diseases, as we have all experienced, can be quite strong, stout, and fairly powerful. So, yeah. Um, In Herb's post, he used the phrase or mentioned the phrase skookumchuck, which the OED defines basically as just fast whitewater, coming from skookum, meaning strong or fast or whatever, and chuck, meaning water. Now... The, the Chuck part, it also calls it Chinook jargon. And I, I just, I cringe at the jargon usage there. I, I don't know. The OED is usually fairly conservative and middle of the road. I mean, it doesn't go out of its way to be necessarily modern. It's the OED after all. But I don't know. It, jargon to me usually connotes something to do with exclusivity at, at best, unintelligibility at worst like it it just has negative connotations for me i think if amy was here she'd either confirm nor deny that or 
and she doubtless have something interesting to say about it. But yeah, like the so the OED definition for jargon, the first one is a, the inarticulate utterance of birds or a vocal sound resembling it. So we're not getting off on a great start. Uh, the third one is unintelligible or meaningless talk or writing, nonsense and gibberish. And the fifth is definitely tug at your collar and make shuddering noises. Uh, quote, a barbarous, rude, or debased language or variety of speech, a lingo used especially of a hybrid speech arising from a mixture of languages. And this last bit's important. Also applied contemptuously to a language by one who does not understand it. And it was interesting when I read that because I was kind of thinking, yeah, like, of course, any language you don't speak is going to seem like jargon because it's just for the speakers of that language. So it's inclusive and you don't understand it. So it's meaningless to you. But anyway, that, yeah, slightly disappointed at the OED for using Chinook jargon instead of just a, a Chinook term or phrase or word, you know, like it, that was not awesome. And the other thing is like, I found it with this and with a couple other words that I've looked up over the course of this show, it, you just kind of hit a wall when you get to a word that has an indigenous North American language root. And it just sort of stops. It traces it back to that and says, oh, well, it's Chinook or Iroquois or Mohawk or Cree or whatever. And it doesn't go any further. And, and that's fair enough to a point. But I don't know. I, I don't know enough about indigenous languages to know this for sure, but based on the fact that every other language does this all the time and has throughout history, you, you got to think that these words came from somewhere and have their own stories. And I'd really like to find out how to find out what they were, because I can't, I can't find anything anywhere about indigenous North American language etymology and, and such. So if someone out there has something that I could look at, that'd be awesome. Do let me know. But anyway, so yeah, that's about all I can say about Skookum Chuck. Uh, started being used by uh, white guys and white people in general in the mid-1800s. And in the earliest ones, it is often them recounting stories about their interactions with the native populations and words that they use. And it's definitely a, a co-op, well, not, maybe not co-opting, but just it comes out of that context pretty directly and then didn't seem to go super far. So anyway, there you go. That's Skookum. Thank you for the suggestion, Herb. Hope that answers some of your questions. I don't know. So our next word, uh, our next suggestion, comes from B.T. Newberg. And this was, I shared our Facebook post on another group on Facebook called the Humanities Podcasters Facebook group. And B.T. Newberg asked about the origin of the phrase, Bob's your uncle. Now, I'm going to open this up by saying, this is a little bit outside of our normal oeuvre. Uh, and for phrase etymology, the people you're really looking for are uh, the fine folks over at the Bunny Trails podcast. This is their whole jam is taking turns of phrase and examining um, phrases and proverbs and stuff. And it's, it's quite cool. And most of them have really neat stories and stuff. So I recommend them. Shout out to Bunny Trails. Apologies for kind of treading on your turf slightly. But here we go anyway. So Bob's your uncle is interesting. Bob's your uncle, the idea is usually, and in fact, in some def, some dictionaries, it's actually listed as, and Bob's your uncle, because it's sort of a, there's a finality, everything's wrapped up, you're all good, you're all set, everything's fine. You do this, you do that, and Bob's your uncle, as in, and then you're done, and you're home free, type of thing. It's a British expression originally, but like everything else, we're all using it. So here we are. Um, an interesting one. Three possible origins that I've seen. I know which one I, I, mean, I definitely know which one I like best. I know which one I kind of feel makes the most sense to me, but I'll give you all three. So the first recorded usage, before we get into that, in the OED of the phrase Bob's Your Uncle in print was from the 1937 second edition of lexicographer Eric Partridge's Dictionary of Slang and Unconventional English, Colloquialisms and Catchphrases, Fossilized Jokes and Puns, General Nicknames, Vulgarisms, and Such Americanisms as Have Been Naturalized. 
Got to love these long titles. So that's the first use. The first etymology and the, the most, by far the most widespread one, if you look up, hey, why do we say Bob's your uncle? This is the story. And I, I, it's fun. I hope it's the right one. So there was a British prime minister in the 19th century who had the not at all pompous sounding name of, buckle up, Robert Arthur Talbot Gascoigne Cecil, third Marquess of Salisbury. So there you have it. Eat your heart out, bandicoot, cucumber bund, or whoever. Um, incidentally, neat bit of trivia because we're all nerds here. This was the last British prime minister to be a member of the House of Lords. And he was also prime minister three times, interspersed with like at least one or two other dudes between his various runs, but for a total of like 13 years. So he was prime minister for a long time, but spread out. Anyway, sorry, tangents. Uh, so I can't even just blame it on Amy. It's probably always been my fault. So the story goes that uh, good old Bobby Cecil gave some pretty cushy and prominent political appointments to his nephew, and his nephew's name is Arthur Balfour, who must have benefited from these because he immedi Balfour immediately succeeded his uncle as prime minister after his uncle finished up his last term. So the beginning of the 20th century, Arthur Balfour was British prime minister. Back in 1887, he was appointed, I have it written down here, appointed, uh, where was it, chief secretary of Ireland in 1887. And so basically the idea is because of his uncle Robert or his uncle Bob, Arthur Balfour had a pretty cushy life. He had a, he had a pretty good thing going. And so that was that idea that, well, when Bob's your uncle, you get all the things. So I like that. I like the fact that it's got a fairly common thing. You can you can see how that would work. Anyway, that's if you do like one quick Google search, that's the one you leave with. And I'm sort of okay with that. There's another possibility, uh, and this also is brought up in the entry in Partridge. Now, in his Dictionary of Slang and Unconventional English, Partridge says that the phrase dates back to circa 1890. He doesn't go beyond that. He doesn't delve into it. He doesn't say anything about the context of where it came from or why 1890 sticks out. He doesn't reference any sources. That said, you know, if Arthur Balfour was appointed Chief Secretary of Ireland in 1887, thanks to his Uncle Bob, you can see how, you know, by 1890, people would be using the phrase, if indeed that's where it came from. So that, you know, sure, maybe that's what he was alluding to. I, we don't know. It's not in there. But the other thing that Partridge gives us in his definition of Bob's your uncle is uh, there's a, a term for like street slang, criminal underworld slang known as can't, C-A-N-T, no apostrophe. And there's an old can't phrase called all is Bob that means basically everything's safe, everything's safe and sound, all is safe. And this, this was cool. So I, many thanks to to BT for suggesting this because I got to look up all kinds of really cool old books. So there's a late 18th century Kant dictionary called A Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. And it's it's from that late 1700s period where the Fs and Ss can never be told apart. You know what I'm talking about. So this one defines Bob as being a shoplifter's assistant or one that receives and carries off stolen goods. And also includes the phrase, all is Bob, all is safe. I, I'm conjecture alert, but I'm assuming this means this is sort of from the idea, like if Bob is the dude that you give all your stolen stuff to right away and he runs off with it, once all is with Bob, you're pretty much good because you don't have any of the stolen junk on you anymore. So I think you're probably okay, or at least more okay than if you got busted with all the stuff on you. So there's the idea that, you know, Bob came in there and I guess the thought would be that if Bob is this guy that makes everything safe by taking all your stuff and taking care of you, then if Bob's your uncle, then that's even better. Maybe? I don't know. There's nothing to clarify that transition if this is where the expression Ed Bob's your uncle came from. But again, you can kind of make sense of it. You can sort of see how it might be where it comes from. Oh, another bit of trivia because I am like a small puppy dog who sees sparkly things. While I was looking through that Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. In episode 42, where I talked about the word spruce, 
the idea of spruce up the place. It's kind of a fun one. I liked that one. But the dictionary of the vulgar tongue has an old usage of the word spruce that's just sort of out in the wild. It was just on the same page. But the entry under bobish, B-O-B-B-I-S, is so bobish is defined as smart, clever, or spruce. So I thought that was kind of cool. Now there's there's a website called the Phrase Finder. It's phrases.org.uk. I've seen it every now and then. I I don't know much about it. I haven't done a lot of research into it. Perhaps uh, Bunny Trails can weigh in if this is one of their sources that they like or dislike or whatever. But the third possibility seems to be the one that the Phrase Finder site is leaning towards. And that it is com- it comes from the music halls of the early 20th century. So that site says that the first use of Bob's Your Uncle in print was from 1924 from a Scottish musical review, touring musical review, called Bob's Your Uncle. And I should note, I mean, again, I don't know the site. It doesn't necessarily, just because it's got it and the OED doesn't, the OED has it as a later date, it doesn't necessarily mean that either of them are wrong or that it doesn't have it, you know, just different sources, I guess, but I don't know. One of the things the phrase finder kind of tries to poke holes at the political nepotism theory and leans more on the music hall theory is one, just the, fair enough, the power of popular music to spread an idea or a phrase around. And there was a song in, um, I think it was the early 30s, that also used the Bob's your uncle phrase, your uncle Bob will take care of you, Bob's your blah, 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 whatever. So there's that. But one thing I kind of raised eyebrows at, it it sort of takes it, the phrase finder folks take a jab at the nepotism theory by saying, basically looking at the dates and saying, you know, Arthur Balfour was prime minister in, I think it was 1905 he got elected. He was in power, he was in office for like a year and a half or something. So by the mid 20s, it's been 20 years, a couple decades since the second of the two dudes to become prime minister were prime minister. And like 35 years since the incident that supposedly gave this phrase its origin happened. And the phrase finder basically says, Uh, Quote, it would seem odd for a phrase to be coined about the nepotism of an uncle for his nephew well after both prime ministers were out of office. End quote. And that, it's like, okay, fine. But I feel like that's making that classic mistake of equating first printed usage with first usage more generally. Like there's nothing to indicate to me anyway that it's just been coined at that point, that it gets written down. You know, you could, for me, I don't have much of a problem with thinking that a phrase that starts being just used in popular expressions, just talking at the neighbor over the whatever the Victorian equivalent of a water cooler is at work. You know, I could see it taking maybe 30 years before anyone bothers to write it down. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me. And it would be interesting to hear what the Scottish Musical Review was meaning by it and how it became so popular if it was just out of the blue, just was coined for the purposes of naming that show. But anyway, so I, the phrase finder folks, they like the music hall thing for the chronology of it. I kind of like the nepotism thing. I think that makes sense to me, but they're out there. Ultimately, it's an origin unknown thing, like most of this stuff is. But uh, there you go. So Bob's your uncle, either... Bob, if your guy that you give all your stolen stuff to is your uncle, you're probably even safer than you were already. Or Scottish musical reviews are super influential. Or old British white guys gonna old British white guy and give each other power when they can. So take of that what you will, but it's probably one of those three by all best guesses. So thanks for thanks to BT for that, and also for the excuse to get a bunch new bunch of new old-timey dictionaries. Um, So the next few come from our Facebook page. Next up is Annie Chastain or Chastain. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I haven't asked yet. I should. Um, And her question was about the word keen, K-E-E-N. 
which is one I've heard for a while. I think it's relatively popular. I think now it's kind of an archaic, like, when I think of it, I think kind of happy days, 70s, happy, trying to be 50s happy type of idea. But anyway, extremely old word and very Germanic. Uh, the OED is points out very strongly, there are no cognates of this word outside of the Germanic sort of branch of the English family tree. So super old. And there are some, there are, there's a lot of debate on what the sort of original sense of the word meant in these various old Frisian, old Dutch, old Norse, old high German, all the rest. Uh, earliest English usage comes in, in the, the heady days of 879, in the, another work of King Alfred. And the, this was sort of the predominant sense in Old English, and it meant brave, bold, valiant, daring, all that kind of good stuff. So that's 879, brave, bold, valiant, daring. This is also, I think, the Old German sense, and a couple of other Germanic languages have this kind of bold and daring sense to it. Um, a little bit later on, well, a little bit later, 1225, the word kind of morphed, and the OED basically says, we have no idea where this sense change came from, from brave, bold. But it started to basically be a synonym for very sharp when talking about cutting instruments or weapons. And you talk about the keen edge of a scythe or a sword. Um, so that's sort of mid-13th century. In the mid-1300s, we get keen used to describe people. And at first it meant... Uh, the, the sense of, oh, he's very keen, as in eager or ardent, fervid, very passionate, impassioned, full of energy, vim and vigor, all the rest. Um, but it's it's not until the 1700s that it takes on a couple of the uses that I think are the more common ones now. So you hear about um, a particularly honed or practiced or just gifted um someone being gifted in this, a sense or an ability. You talk about your keen eyesight or someone's keen mind or their keen sense of humor or something like that. And that doesn't show up until the 1700s. But interestingly, this one ties back to another really old, sort of around the turn of the first to second millennium, around the year 1000, where it for a brief time, seems to have meant wise, clever, or learned, skilled, that kind of thing. And this lines up with the Old Norse sense of the word. And there is some thought that this might be the original sense and that it went from clever and skilled to skilled on the battlefield. And then if you're skilled on the battlefield, you're probably a lot braver because you're better than everyone. So there's that sense that the idea that it went that way. There's not really a lot of evidence to suggest that over anything else, but that's one of the ideas. Um, so yeah, not a lot of evidence about that either, which is interesting. Um, there was something Annie wrote that seems to have been tying the word keen and that sharp-mindedness to the word, the English verb to know, um, but they're completely different words. They just, they don't have anything really to do with one another. Different roots, different etymologies, just whole different branches. Just one of those things that kind of, huh, that word also starts with a K and means kind of sort of the same thing sometimes. But that's interesting. So there's the word keen. Thanks for submitting that, Annie. Uh, next up is another word that I had never heard of before. And this one is inkle, I-N-K-L-E. And it was from Gretchen Fancher on our Facebook page, submitted this one. Thank you, Gretchen. So a small band or tape loom is what she said. I, again, I never heard the word, so off to Google's default dictionary for me, which defines it as, quote, a kind of linen tape formerly used to make laces or the linen yarn from which this is manufactured. So that is inkle. Now, this is going to be a short one because I did try, but I just can't find anything. So there's really not a lot out there one of these origin unknown things. The OED etymology section is very short, but it is kind of funny in that way of the OED being funny when it wants to shut down. Like it doesn't know the answer, doesn't know the right answer, 
but it knows what the wrong answer is and it's going to let you know. So here's the entirety of what the OED etymology section of Inkel says. So uh, Dutch Enkel, formerly Enkel, E-N-C-K-E-L, Inkel, I-N-C-K-E-L, meaning single, is suggested by the sound and it is quite conceivable that this might be applied to a, quote, narrow or, quote, inferior tape. But historical evidence is wanting. And here we go. Identity of origin with lingual, as conjectured by some, is out of the question. So if you were thinking, maybe that comes from lingual. I don't know what lingual is, but maybe you do. And maybe you were thinking that. And I'm here to tell you that the OED thinks you are out of your mind. I don't know why, because I don't know what lingual means. And I don't even really know what inkle means, but I know that we don't know where it comes from. So I guess you're welcome, Gretchen. <laughs> Sorry, it could have been more useful, but there we are. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have something from Liz Junken on our Facebook page. And Liz was asking about the word widow and particularly about widower. And so... Widow is a woman whose husband has died and she has not remarried. And a widower is a man whose wife has died and who is not remarried. And Liz's kind of thing with this was sort of saying, it's interesting that it's widower. Like you think of an, the ER ending, you think of someone who is an action, you know, like thrower, singer, you know, something like that. Um, and she was wondering if, you know, was widow a verb? Is it? How does that work? And that was a good enough point because I read that and went, huh, I don't know either, but that's really interesting. Um, this one is also, because they're great at finding these, apparently these unknown origin, but for weird reasons, words, because this one's hard to figure out etymology wise because it's extremely old. Like we thought keen was old because it went back to, you know, Germanic and stuff. This one, there's, there's examples in everything. Uh, Sanskrit, ancient Greek, ancient Latin, all the way through the Germanic line of the family tree. Like just everything has it and everything has it meaning the same thing. So it's all, it's always it, with one exception that I'll get to in a second. It's always the, like the idea of just a widow, a, pers a woman whose husband has died and now she's on her own. Except in ancient Greek, Aethios, Apologies to any ancient Greek speakers out there, where it meant a young bachelor or generally a young unmarried person. So not the sense, still the sense of without a spouse, but not because they died. And also sort of the default one is that it's a man, a young man in ancient Greek in this particular one, not necessarily a young woman. So that's kind of interesting. And there's something in there for another talk with a smarter person than me about how universal the experience of a wife being notably and unfortunately left in a position of extreme vulnerability because her husband has died. Almost like this whole toxic masculinity thing has been bad for everyone forever. The dudes always have to go and do the dangerous stuff and the women are entirely reliant on those dudes. And when they die, they're in a really bad situation. So anyway, like I say, another time with smarter people, but something that occurred to me when I was reading that anyway. Um, now, the really interesting thing here to me is that ER ending on widower. So again, we have Liz pointing out that it's usually, it's often associated with an action and a person doing an action. But when you look into the ER suffix a little bit more, it's, it's a bit of a broader sense than that. It's not necessarily someone who does a thing. It's, now the, the OED puts it in a very gendered way, uh, which in this particular case does tie into it. So I'm going to keep that because it makes sense as to why this is a widower as a specifically a male widow. But the ER ending, according to the OED, is a man who has to do with something. So it, it, the ER is having to do with and then whatever the root noun is or discusses or whatever. So you've got certain things that are an action. So singer, uh, putter, I guess. Like roofer is one, I guess, but roof isn't really. Anyway, now I'm struggling to come up with examples, but you get the idea. But there's also another sort of sense where you think of a lot of these occupational surnames. And so like some of them, Tanner is a good one, right? 
because that's an action. But you have hatter, or you have cooper, you have a lawyer, or sawyer, from saw, a sawmill worker, the occupational surname part of it, taking that Y-E-R instead of just E-R formation. And then there's another sense, sort of common in, it says modern German, where it's a resident of or native of a certain place. So you think Londoner, New Yorker, Icelander, that kind of thing. And then there's a broader sense where it has to do with place, but not a specific place. So you get northerner, southerner, or you get foreigner, something like that. So the idea of widower is that it's a man having to do with being a widow is kind of the the interesting thing. So it's, um, yeah, being a man, being in the situation of a widow is a widower for that reason, the same reason that a hatter is someone who has to do with hats. So there you go, widower, not a verb, just a very gendered thing since forever. So that wraps up our listener word extravaganza 2.0, or electric boogaloo, if you like. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted stuff. Thanks again to everyone who is listening in this weird and bizarre, crazy world that we're living in right now. And we will be back again, the both of us, for our next episode. And we will talk to you later. All right. Bye. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.